recorded the uh, the bio yet. Yeah. Hey, did you start? All right. All right. Let me pull this up. I'm going to read the official biography. Okay. And then uh, we'll get into more of what I know about you. Okay. All right. So this is a unvarnished podcast. I'm Ryan Brown. We are at Anthony's Fine Art. Anthony's Antiques, Anthony's Fine Art. Yes to all of the above. Oh, okay. Uh, with Micah Christensen, he is... Uh, I'm going to read the official biography here, and then uh, we'll get going. Micah earned his doctorate in the history of art from Uni- University College London, where he traveled throughout Spain, Italy, France, and the United Kingdom to study how artists were trained in the 18th and 19th centuries. I'm, gonna, I'm excited to get into that, why you did that. He received his master's in fine art from Sotheby's Institute London. Then he worked with the founder of the Antiques Home Roadshow and other experts in London auction world. Micah has lectured at the British Library for the University of Cambridge. He is currently a partner of Anthony's Fine Art and Antiques in Salt Lake City. He continues to lecture, write, and consult with public institutions and private collectors. So, we met in 2005 when you were still in advertising yes yeah what were you doing before you decided to jump into this world and uh, i was running away from the family business yeah (laughs) yeah i had uh um i'd grown up with my father being an antique and art dealer and um he'd worked there mostly moving furniture and uh and doing really hard work which you know, now that I, I do more of desk work, I kind of miss that physical activity. Yeah. But uh, I I wanted to kind of make it on my own. And if uh, to make a long story short, I got a scholarship in vocal performance and opera. And then I went to college and realized that um, that may have not been the best way to support myself going forward. So the more practical angle was uh was was business and i i got elected the president of the business school at the university and just kept going down that route and i got hired right out of college uh by uh stephen r covey and his team and became a marketing director promoting the work of business authors and uh, i did that for about five or six years and uh, as I was traveling, I could not give up my interest in the arts. Yeah. So I, I found myself getting more and more involved in the family business, almost like a hobby. And when you met me in 2005, I, had, I, w- I, was, I was just turning the corner and looking more towards the, the fine arts. I had mentors who kept pulling, pulling at my um, coat sleeves like... Uh, um, in addition to my father, Anthony Christensen, I had um, Vern Swanson, who is the man who had written the catalog resume on John William Godward and Lawrence Almatadema, who uh, I'd known since I was a kid. And he kept saying, come on, come on over here and look at what I'm doing. So yeah. you, you met me right at, the, right at that turning point. Yeah. It's, um, so you went, I had no idea you were an opera singer. Well, I don't think I'd call myself that anymore, but I, I trained that way for, for about a decade. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you went from, I think that's an interesting kind of route because, and very common because you went from being in the arts, performing arts, having a passion for that, mm-hmm. which w- when you're in the arts, whether it's performing arts, singing, music, writing, it seems like there's a it develops a greater, uh, deeper appreciation for all of the arts. So, mm. so, and then you grew up with the, the antiques, the, I mean, the, the kind of work you guys bring through here is so high level, brilliant. Um, so you grew Thank up you. with this and then went the w- responsible route, <laughs> would you say? The, <laughs> the practical the, route, yeah. yeah. The practical route. The putting route. bread on the table route. But you got really, really good at that as well, which is... Um, you know, uncommon that you would have uh, an aptitude for both. And then as happens, uh, I've seen it, you know, how many times 
uh, how, how many retired lawyers or doctors get back into the right. arts that kind of return to that passion. You did it a little bit earlier in your mid twenties. Yeah, and, and I'd have back to, to it. I'd have to say that my father had done all of the the hard work that made it possible for me to come back into it. Yeah. Right. I, there was a business that was already established, so I didn't have to start from scratch. Right. Which most people don't have that. Yeah. It was, a, it was, it's a pretty, pretty luxurious option for me to be able to jump back in and, yeah. and say, I'm, oh yeah, I'm going to join this thing that's already established without having to make all the sacrifices that a lot of those people have to do. So the decision to, um, come from the business world, um, uh, and pretty high level business, as well um obviously that had to have helped uh, your understanding of how to uh approach things from the business side but um how quickly did the decision to go back to school get your master's in the arts uh um especially i mean sotheby's in london and then on to get your phd um what led to that decision well i when i came back um my father had had kind of a health crisis, and that was the decision to definitely come back into the business. Um, I remember getting a phone call from him. I was at the time I had um, I was looking to to live in Washington D.C. I was even looking at uh, at homes there with my wife, and we had we we were going to move and and uh, work on a business venture there, and um, got news that my father had 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 some kind of we don't we, to this day we don't know if it was a stroke or a heart attack and i got a call and he said i know you've been interested in this do you want to come take over the the business with your with 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 you know your business my business partner here and when i came back um it wasn't entirely clear whether or not he was going to live another three months six months we thought that it was going to be a very short time and i was going to be running things which would have been premature because i did not know much i had a, i still have a lot to learn yeah and um, as he got better, there's just too many generals. And I remember um, Vern Swanson saying to me at the time, and, uh, and, and my father saying to me, you know, why don't you go, why don't you go to Europe? And why don't you broaden your base in this speciality, right? So I, I called a few people. The choices were going to France, um, I speak Spanish fluently, um, and my French is is okay. And thought, okay, maybe maybe I can go there and I can do the Christie's um, auction house. These auction houses had set up a very practical um, school, um, Sotheby's, Christie's, and Bonhams to a lesser extent back in the 1960s. These are auction houses that have been around since the 17th and 18th centuries. And they had set up um, in the mid 20th century, all of them at about the same time, an object oriented course in order to train their experts. So you could go there and you would get a behind the scenes, not only at the auction house, but you would go to royal collections, major museums, and you would be handling the objects and not having conversations like a lot of other art historians do about the social history of things. That was part of it a little bit, but you'd actually, you know, you'd take apart um, Marie Antoinette's furniture and you'd have discussions about how it was put together and how to tell the difference between it and a forgery. Yeah. It was a very practical education for the kind of business that we had, which at the time was 80% furniture, mostly European. We were bringing things from across, uh, from, from across the pond and selling them here but, and all over the world. And I wanted a technical education. Yeah. So uh, in choosing between those different schools, Sotheby's seemed the best option. And uh, I went to, Lo I, we moved to London, my wife and I, and we were there for, for, a, uh, for 18 months at first. And, um, and, and, and uh, that's where we got an education on, in old masters. There were four courses. They were, they, they were all part of this master's degree. It was uh, 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 furniture and decorative arts was one. Two was old masters. Three was contemporary works of art and then four was ceramics and then you'd have to choose and gravitate towards whatever you were gravitating towards you'd have to commit to writing a book length thesis on one subject and i wanted to focus on how artists were trained 
Um, and I'd happened to go on vacation while I was in London to Madrid and because I spoke Spanish and I walked into the, the office of the director of the Prado and I said, Hey, I, I, I don't see many people writing about what the Spanish did. Can I write about it? And he kind of gave me the keys to the kingdom and yeah. I wrote my masters. I used Soroya, Joaquin Soroya as my example of how artists were trained in Spain. But, uh, that turned into a, I, uh, my master's and then I stayed um, in England and uh, did my PhD and just broadened it just kept, yeah kept diving deeper that's right that's right so uh, I mean that sounds so different than uh, a, a typical art history master's or PhD it some of the training sounds like you got to uh, I mean obviously you, you focused on the education aspect of how people were trained but also um, the way you, you know, you're talking about taking apart uh, um, furniture and, and really kind mm. of deconstructing things uh, sounds like you're getting a, a pretty deep practical uh, understanding of the craft of these arts as well, which is I, I've found to be somewhat uncommon um, among art historians. I know you, you knew Gerald Ackerman. Yes, very well. And, and uh, I know he went to the Florence Academy and actually studied the Barg course when he was uh, coming into writing it. And uh, that kind of effort uh, and deep dive by art historians is, uh, I feel like, gives you uh, an edge on everyone else. It gives you such an understanding of not just the art, the social context, the historical context, but how it was made, why it was made that way, Um, which as an artist, is important would be important for me for somebody to understand if they were going to talk about it um how do you think that that helps you now uh as you're in the antique business you're dealing with paintings all the time Uh, i mean you just pulled out a painting and said who do you think did this and you're 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 reverse engineering it almost to to not only fit it in place but take it from a technical aspect and say who could have done this right and i feel like you understand that um you know better than than most art historians i well i appreciate that and i think it's something you're always learning that's something that i've noticed from from people who i admire my father foremost but other people like jerry ackerman and Vern swanson and uh, peter naum who is the expert on edward bird jones a lot of the people who were i saw as my mentors were people who were worried about this this skill that became devalued in art history, which is connoisseurship. It was the ability to look at a work of art and try and understand the skills and the craftsmanship that went into making it. And what art history mostly became over time was a history of personalities and of social history. Right. And and I'm not saying that that isn't legitimate. It just it just was the difference between me going into a um, I remember when I did my master's at um, at Sotheby's, which was what they called an object-oriented course. And you would you would go into a room after having ten lectures on Ming ceramics, and um, you would go to the greatest Ming collections in Europe, and then they would bring you into a room and they would pay, place five objects in front of you and say, "One of these is not a real Ming. Hmm. Why?" which one and why and you'd be graded on your ability to kind of break down the ability to to to, to think of things in terms yeah. of actually looking at the object then when i did my phd I, I i went to i was accepted to oxford and cambridge and the university of bristol and also to the court told who are all great schools but when it comes to doing your phd especially in the UK, your job is, it's a pure research degree. You have to produce 80 to 100,000 words, which if you think of the first Harry Potter book, I think it was something like 14 or 15,000 words. So I had to write 100,000 words on my given topic. And you have to have as your advisor at the school you go to a real partner. So your partner matters. And I remember going to each one of these universities and and the court told the person said to me, it was John House, the eminent John House, who was the expert on Manet and on um, Corbet, who was a real connoisseur and a real thinker. And he was about to retire. And he said, well, I can help you during the first year. But after that, 
the only people on our staff are really feminist or commu- or Marxist art historians. And most of them never even actually look at the physical works or handle them. Hmm. And they're more interested in social history. I remember sitting down with Tom Gretton, who, was my, um, who would become my advisor, and he said, well, I've read your master's. And he said, it's okay, <laughs> which it was. It was just okay. And he said, um, he said, I was really interested in this image that you chose by Soroy. It was clear he was looking at this print, this print, and this print, which came out at this time and this time. And I'm sure that he ran into Bastien Lepage, Lepage's work here. And it was almost as if when I heard him talk about it, I thought, now that's practical. That's someone who can tell me what an artist is looking at and why they're making the choices that they're making yeah. on, from an artist's perspective almost. He had been the editor of the Oxford Art Journal, and it was a very lonely place to be doing my PhD. I was, uh, that's why I gravitated towards Jerry Ackerman. At the time, the family business um, had acquired two major um, uh, uh, statues by Jerome. One was the, was the flight out of Egypt, the flight to Egypt, um, and then the other was the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem by Jerome. And um, I had to go to Jerry Ackerman at the time, who was who did the catalog resume, yeah. was the world expert in Claremont. And I remember sitting down with him, and he said, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm working on my PhD. He said, who are you writing about? I said, Soroya. And he said, do you think you took fencing lessons? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it was the story that Jerome was giving advice to John Singer Sargent about how When you use long brushes, especially if you're trying to um, resolve in the viewer's eye a subject, you're keeping it sketchy, but you're standing far away from it, and you want it to resolve in the viewer's eye from a distance, you have to be able to, instead of paint up close and back up, paint up close and back up, wouldn't it just be better if you took fencing lessons and, uh, and could control the brush up front? He said, I wonder if Soroya did that. I thought, no wow, I got to spend more time with him. So I ended up spending, I, I would go to class, I would go to um, gatherings for my PhD where people would be talking about Picasso's mistresses. And they'd be talking about whether or not um, an artist was was from a particular class and therefore he was influenced by the class struggles of his time, which isn't... a you know, a bad way of thinking about art on some level. We're all influenced on those kinds of things. And then I would have to supplement it with a conversation with Jerry Ackerman saying, you know, I think that Soroya didn't really use a model here. I think he's working exclusively from photographs and this is why. And he'd have these, these discussions. So it, I was the only one out of a hundred students who were in graduate school working on 19th century art. And on top of that, I was the only one who I knew worldwide that I was having discussions with, other than maybe one or two people, who were trying to piece together studio practice. Yeah. And I was trying to do that not being an artist myself. Right. Which is, you know, I'm still bad at that. I'm still not an artist, right? People ask me that all the time. Oh, you must paint, right? Like, no, no, I don't, I don't yeah. paint. So I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm insecure about that, but I try and think of it in terms of, it's just a different skill set. Yeah. It's just a different skill set. Well, it's interesting. Uh, what do you, th- I mean, what made you s- focus on 19th century makes sense to me because of, of so much of what, uh, the family business deals with. Right. Uh, art, art, from from painting sculptures uh e- even the furniture um spanish makes sense because you, you're fluent in, in spanish uh, but why education why would you choose to focus on the the development of artists and the education system um of 19th century spanish painters it's something that you know, I don't know if I've got a perfect answer for it. I can tell you a few reasons that I, why do we all do the things we do, right? And, and if we had to explain them, maybe we'd be able to come up with a coherent answer. Yeah. I, I, am, I can tell you some reasons why I think I made the choices I did. First of all, family business. I grew up in my home 
um, because my father was a collector long even before he started being a dealer he had he had a collection of works by William Merritt Chase and and uh, by by uh, I remember we had a Thomas Moran and we had other works wow. by 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 artists that were uh, they were significant pieces we had um, we had um, Eastman Johnson works in our home and 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 so I I think when you grow up with quality and a certain kind of art artwork you you want to know more about it one yeah right so so there was that piece another one was that uh i i grew up knowing artists who um were interested in that century too so growing up i knew people like uh michael coleman was a friend of the family and michael coleman even though he's a western artist who's mostly dealing with landscape he had a real love of 19th century artists. And when you'd go into his home, he had Italian watercolors from the 1880s yeah. that seemed to me to be the most magical and exotic. And even now when I look at 18th century, 1880s watercolors by those who were in Rome, you think, oh my gosh, yeah. how did they achieve this? Um, and I, th- I think that his collection more than even his art was something that spurred an interest yeah. in me. But Growing up in in uh, in Utah, uh, and you know this too from being in this region, because of the religious element and a kind of patronage and interest in figurative art, there was a group of people who were looking at at religious art from the 19th century. They weren't usually doing their good good versions of it, but they were at least reaching for it. Sure. And so there was a there was a an interest I'd say here more than even most places in the world, for for how did how did those artists do that? Mm-hmm. And w- my father was out there buying it. I mean, he was buying works by um, Tissot. By we had a, a a great John Singer Sargent of a of a crucifixion scene, and we had a number of other works that that were by second or third tier 19th century artists, but they were first tier works by those artists. And I got to know about the vocabulary of the salon through it. And then I would run into people like Jerry Ackerman or, or, um, uh, Vern Swanson, and they had done most of their work in the seventies and eighties. And so when I got to do my masters, I remember thinking, geez, like all the biggies have been taken. The John Singer Sargent's been taken, and and uh, Bougaro's been taken, and I don't I don't want to focus on, I don't want to rehash right. the work that other people. I want to discover someone. Yeah, kind of right. Open the door to somebody else, and and you find that that's kind of egotistical way to look at the art world because then you think of yourself as an art historian as owning an artist, <laughs> which is you can't do that. Right, and that's that's a false premise for art history. Anyway, it's I'm going to be famous off by being a parasite on the back of an yeah. artist, right? Well, you could also say I'm I'm opening a world that hasn't been opened yet. I'm right. diving deeper into somebody that's important. Rather, so I'm sure there was there was that uh, and, and pure intent. There I think as there well. there was, and I remember being on the on the panel of a of a. I was on the panel of an art renewal cent- art renewal center salon um, discussion that happened at the Salma Gundy Club. It was me. It was Jacob Collins, Fern Swanson, and um, oh, um, Ross, Fred Ross, Fred Ross. Yeah, and and uh, you know I'm not going to say anything that's going to offend Fred Ross. It's very hard to offend Fred Ross. <laughs> And Fred Ross got up and he kind of gave his his uh, his version, which was which was Verne's version of the 19th century had the greatest artists who ever existed on the face of the planet, and and damn those modernists, yeah. right? Yeah. Who destroyed destroyed an entire tradition of art, and and that was the argument i grew up with and i think a lot of us grew up with it it's kind of the fox news angle on uh, on <laughs> on uh, on the history of art and i um remember reading french and the art uh, uh, art 
the French Academy in the 19th century right. by Albert, Albert Boim. Boim. Yeah. Or Boimy, depending on... Even people who knew him didn't have a consistent pronunciation <laughs> of his name. And um, and I remember that there was this real... Um, the, the, the fad among 19th century art historians when I was in London was this... What I feel like is a false dichotomy between modernism and traditionalism. And... And uh, liberalism is trying to destroy conservatism. And it, it, it's, it was just a very weird contemporary way of looking at the world. But what to me felt like was not being discussed was the actual skill set yeah. that had been lost through, through, the, through the loss of the academy. And we can get back to this at another time. But I think the really, my, my current theory is that the people who really destroyed the academy were Zorn Sergeant Soroya and those people who felt like that they didn't learn anything from the academy, that they were geniuses and they couldn't you couldn't teach what they knew. And so they weren't gonna teach people what they knew. Yeah. And so it wasn't it wasn't so much that somebody said to them, What you have isn't worth learning. It was more like, Well what I have you can't be taught. I'm a genius. Yeah. yeah. And um and so that's another argument for another discussion. Um or potentially later in this discussion. But I I remember going to Spain and seeing these works that had not been really on view for a hundred years in Spain. They had been, they were monumental figurative works by artists whose names that most people won't remember. And they were the people who taught Soroya. They were um, Juana la Loca by Pradilla. Mm. They were works by, um, by, uh, uh, Federico de Madrazo and Raimundo de Madrazo. And Raimundo de Madrazo was a really famous portraitist in France. Um, they were um, by Antonio Gisbert. They were by H Jose Casado de la Lizal. And these are people who almost no one knew. Yeah. But they were working at the highest level. And many of their students and it would, would go on to found academies in Latin America. And these people were winning... 10% of all prizes by the end of the 19th century were won by Spanish artists in, in France, in Germany, in England, and at the Universal Exhibitions, what we call the World's Fairs today. And no one outside of Spain had really opened the door to them. And the more I investigated, the more I learned that they had very obviously and even marketed themselves as being the people who took and perfected what the French had. And I thought to myself, and this is when I went into the I, I went into the office of the director of the Prado at the time, and I said, "I think there's a story to be told here. I think that um, there are a lot of people who want to know how to paint like people did in the 19th century, and the Spanish yeah. seem to have systematized that in a way that other people hadn't. Hmm. I'd like to study that." And he said, I think you're right, and uh, I'll help you, and I'll open up our resources to you. And um, I went and pitched it back to my people in, uh, in London, and they said, great, you don't have to show up here to class. Spend all the time you want. I spent almost every weekend in Spain. Wow. And, and uh, I probably traveled over the period, that period 40 times to Spain in a period of, of, uh, of two years. And I uh, was basically living in Madrid and Valencia and was traveling um, elsewhere. And I was going through the classroom grading grades and daily lesson materials of, of, uh, of, of Soroya um, had a color study. And this is what his teacher said was the best right way to do it. And his teacher had studied with... Um, his teacher, his teacher had studied with De La Roche and Eng, and he would say, this is how Eng would have taught it. This is how mm. De La Roche would have taught it. This is how Madrasso taught it. And you're doing it wrong, and this is the right way to do it. Wow. <laughs> and so you would, you would see almost directly this, this practice of this is the way that they taught them, that they taught their students was the right and the wrong way to do it. Yeah. The difference between that and looking at French materials at the same time was that the French didn't say much because it was so ingrained. It was so subconscious, a lot of what yeah. was being taught at the time, that it didn't need to be said. Hmm. So you'd go into a French classroom and it was just understood 
that this is the right way and the wrong way. Yeah. And occasionally you'd get very helpful notes to, and to, if an alien had shown up in France, it would have been more confusing. Yeah. In Spain, it was less confusing. It doesn't mean they were doing better work. The clarity of their conversations yeah. about why they were making the choices they were making. And back to your original question, why did I choose classroom practice? I was interested in Soroya because I liked his work like a lot of people did. And I wanted to know where he came from. And I remember, um, this was during my master's degree, very beginning of my master's degree. And Peter Trippi at Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, who's involved in a lot of other things. At the time, he was also the director of the um, Middle Eastern Collection Museum. It'll come to me. Anyway, he was, uh, he was doing a piece on um, Antonio Lopez Garcia. And he said, I understand you're in Spain a lot. And we knew each other. And I'd written a review of some exhibition in Spain for him. And he said, can you be my interpreter for Antonio Lopez Garcia? And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I'd be happy to be the interpreter. So we go to the studio and um, there's that, that, um, that quince tree that he had done. The, have you ever seen El Sol de Membrio, yeah, yeah, yeah. The I don't know what they call it in English, but it's the, it's the, the sun on the quince tree in, in, uh, in Spanish. And we're in the courtyard where he did it. And, and he says, come into my studio. And we sat down and Peter Trippi had his questions. And in between um, breaks for this interview, um, I noticed on his wall he had, he had three images on his studio wall pinned up. He had one, which is the porch of the Acropolis. The second one was... Um, Las Hilanderas, uh, The Weavers by Velázquez. And then the third was Christina's World by, by Wyeth. Yeah. And I latched into the second one and I said, you know, Las Hilanderas in the 19th century was the most copied painting by Spanish painters, not the, uh, the, the one that we think of today as being more famous, which is uh, um, Las Meninas. Las Meninas. Yeah. And he said, how would you know that? I said, well, I'm doing some work on Soroya. And he said, ah, oh, Soroya's boring. Who's really interesting are his teachers. Mm. And he said to me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Utah. He said, oh, do you know Bill Whitaker? Interesting. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah. He said, I really admire Bill Whitaker. He said, there are a lot of Utah artists who are really good. He said, there's a lot of things going on there. He said, do you know Camille Corey? I said, yeah, I know Camille Corey. He said, I met a lot of great great artist coming from there. He said, you should go back there. He said, don't go back to London. Go back to Utah. That's more interesting. Hmm. And he said, why don't you do this? He said, why don't you study all this stuff so you can teach the people in Utah how to do, how to do what they did in the 19th century? Because he said, they're sure trying. There are a lot of people who are trying yeah, to do that. Yeah. At first, it didn't, it's like a lot of things in life. You hear yeah. something and you, and you think, Oh, yeah, that's an interesting side comment. But yeah. the, it grew on me over right, time. Right. So when you ask me, like, why did I go into it? It was almost an offhand comment by, by Antonio Lopez Garcia, where he yeah. said, you know, you should, you should take these things that you're learning yeah. and don't just be theoretical about them. Go back and, and, and you've got a group of, you've almost got a group of hamsters right, you right. could work with and, and, and talk to them about what you know. Yeah. And maybe between the two of you, those who are actually doing and those who are doing research. You can piece it back together. You can, you can find something interesting out yeah. of it. Well, I know when we first met, um, uh, my memory of it, it anyway, is uh, I was teaching and you came up to my studio and you wanted to take some drawing lessons initially. You, yes. You know, so, so I think there was a, there had to be some interest in, in at least understanding the background of it, understanding the craft of it. But um, and it, that's tr and that's true. I didn't have any interest in actually becoming a great artist. I had no belief that I'd be a great artist. Yeah, it was more trying to see as an artist sees. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like Jerry Ackerman did, it just I, I think that gives a in a perspective that uh, I don't I don't think you can you can get otherwise. No. Just uh, getting your hands dirty and and learning how to. Um, how to break something down and problem solve really gives an insight into how the artists were creating what they're creating. Yeah. So on, on that note, I'm going to, if you can indulge me, I want to kind of, um, share, a, uh, an idea I have now 
um, that's just kind of hit me recently. Um, and then we'll get back to everything yeah. else. Um, so I, I've always been interested in um, multi-figure narrative painting. I, I love Almatadema, Waterhouse, uh, uh, Jerome. These are kind of my gods, Bastien Lepage, and um, everybody we've been talking about. Uh, mm. But Mine too. Um, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I went to the Florence Academy. Uh, when I came back to Utah, I thought, you know, this basic education doesn't exist anywhere. I didn't get it in the university. Uh, very common narrative these days. And, and, um, and the basic essentials of drawing and painting is what I got at the Florence Academy. And so coming home, started the Master's Academy of Art and uh, wanted to pass these, um, these skills on um, for a couple of reasons. One, because I couldn't believe it wasn't here. Uh, and two, uh, uh, because I, n I felt like I needed to create um, a, a community around me that um, w knew the essentials so that we could kind of as a group together um, continue moving forward and developing and, and piecing back this information that allows us to, to produce work at the same level of craft as the 19th century. I don't think any of us are trying to recreate the 19th century, but we see something in the level of, uh, of expertise and execution that we want to emulate. So, um, you know, that, that was kind of the motivation to start the school, but the more I'm in it, the more I'm, um, realizing the, the severe drawbacks of current academies. And uh, I think one of the major uh, drawbacks that I see today is the focus, the community focus on the, the end goal. And the end goal almost seems now to be uh, centered on just highly rendered student exercises. You know, if I can get you to do a shadow box still life you know, in a really beautifully rendered way, you have the skills, spread your wings, go for it. Uh, if you can do a really good single portrait on a dark background, you're set, you're, you're good. And the academies end there. Uh, they don't talk about composition. They don't talk about design. They don't talk about narrative. And, and I think that the average student typically is going to adopt whatever the general community is uh, centered on in, in their thinking and philosophy, which means that for a decade after graduation, people are still doing shadow box still lives. They're still doing single, uh, um, portraits and they're amazing, but, um, it feels very much like we're praising good handwriting at this point. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That, that, uh, a lot of this is really just really well executed ABCs of, of art. Uh, I just came across a couple of Russian painters that are doing work that to me is every bit on par with the 19th century. Uh, um, one in particular is doing these processions of soldiers on horses and, and you know, several figures, several horses, outdoor settings, the landscape, every, you know, the colors harmonize, the, everything in the painting works and they're monumental pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess I just wasn't as aware as I needed to be in the past. And I kind of thought maybe this line is broken. Maybe they're just, we're going to have, we have a lot more piecing back, uh, uh, piecing back together to do than I thought. And that could take us decades. But seeing these Russian painters and seeing that, that there are people out there and they're young too, that know this, that are creating these works, makes me think that, um, I mean, I want it. I, I, yeah. I, I can't, I don't, I'm not in a position, I've got five kids, I'm, I, I can't move to Russia for two or three years and learn Russian and, and figure that out. My hope is to uh, bring some of them over here to try and do that. But I also don't feel like we could successfully learn that and begin to create um, those types of monumental works uh, unless there's a larger community that's interested in it. And a lot of the painters working today, when I talk to them and ask them if they're interested in doing, you know, large multi-figure narratives, the answer I continue to get back is, why would I? A, it takes way too long. 
and B, there's no market for it. Um, yeah. And so it's it's incredibly risky. Uh, and on top of that, the time it would take to just really understand the skills that you need to in, in order to, to create that. But I, But this brings me to another point, which is I don't think that these works were created individually. I think that a lot of the 19th century, like you were mentioning um, with the French academies, there was something in the air, there was something in the community and the culture that was generally understood that uh, allowed people to, uh, it almost seeped into their, to their system. It was uh, this osmosis of understanding that um, everybody seemed to really understand. Yeah. And um, and so, so much of the work that was created in the 19th century that I revere, I believe, was created by committee in, in the mm. sense that uh, they were con- constantly uh, interacting. Uh, I've read biographies, you know, they had parties regularly, they would visit each other's studio. I read one quote that said, uh, we would make it a point to visit each other's studios between three and four times a week with the expre- express purpose of uh, critical review. And I think it was that uh, constant interaction. It was the the fact that everybody was was attempting these monumental things, e- even if you're just talking about Bastien Lepage, uh, um, more genre genre scenes. That he was, there was a monumental aspect to it that um, was pervasive in the culture, and that's what I mean by made by committee. It was uh, uh, it was constant critical review. You had a system of of critical review uh, w- with the salons when you would mm-hmm. show you would have uh, a- almost scathing critical review of a lot of these works uh, which which acted as a system of checks and balances for artists it kept them honest um, but as much as I want to bring these Russians here and try and learn that and add that back to the the academic mentality to put our focus on greater uh, attempts at uh, deeper works of art rather than just, you know, the sort of shadow box still life. Um, I'm not sure um, how that would go over in today's market. And I'm not, and I'm not sure that you could uh, accomplish those works if you were an isolated individual being the only one trying to do them. What are I, your thoughts? On, I mean, there's a lot to, I have to, a lot of thoughts. I think that uh, if I had to, part there. Okay, so two thoughts. One is the market is a rear view mirror. And second of all, we inherit the aspirations and anxieties of whoever are our heroes. So the first one of a rear view mirror. One of my clients that I've known since I was a kid my, is uh, John Warnock, the founder of Adobe. He invented the personal printer, invited, invented Photoshop, invented Illustrator, basically created out of nothing billions of dollars an annual revenue from everything from graphic designers to, you know, everything, right? Yeah. There were, there were our modern world works on. And he, I remember one time listening to a lecture where he said that he was at research park as he rocks as uh, uh, research park. And, um, he was describing Photoshop to someone and, um, and they asked to, to do a, a focus group. So they did a focus group and the focus group didn't see any need for it. And he said, of course they didn't because they needed to be shown what was great right. and what it could do. They can only understand things that they've seen before. It's a rear view mirror. Focus yeah. groups are a rear view mirror. And I think that the same is true with art is that on some level, <clears throat> people don't know what they want until you show them what they want. Yeah. And, and um, this, this idea that um, people don't want multi-figure, don't want this or don't want that. Whenever I hear... When an artist says to me, well, what's selling? My reaction is things that are good, (laughs) right? And also things that are available. That are available, right. And I'm not going to, and I I, I was working with an art, uh, I have an artist that I represent named Walter Rain, and Walter Rain has, um, he he trained under the kind of CalArts school in, in California that were the, the famous artist school was basically their incubator. People like Norman Rockwell, the, and, and it was the illustrator world, right? And he was going to have his career as an illustrator, which he did up until the 1990s when Illustrator and um, Photoshop ruined <laughs> the market for him. Yeah. And he was doing um, novel covers and magazine covers and 
And uh, he sent me a group of works that was everywhere from still lifes to multifigural religious works to uh, portraits that he sent me to, to sell for his latest show. And he apologized. He said, I'm so sorry. I just realized that there wasn't really a connection between all these things I sent you. I said, I don't, I don't care. I said, you're, uh, I said, I believe in you and what you're making. And as long as it's good, I can take people wherever you're going. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you, put a Native American in it or a beautiful woman. I'm going to, I'm just going to take whatever you send me because it's good. I think there are very few dealers or artists who think in those terms. And I think right. it's something that there's a reason for why they don't think in those terms. Because there, there, there is a reality of some people do want certain things. Yeah. Right. But, but I, there, there also needs to be a force that's pulling us towards the visionary. Right? So that's the first point. The second point I made, which is we inherit the aspirations and anxieties of what we're, what we're after. Uh, I had a conversation with um, the director of the Arcadia Gallery recently, Stephen. We were, I, whenever I'm in California where I've got a condo, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down and talk. And um, he was telling me that anytime someone who's even a great artist who's recently graduated from one of the current ateliers comes to him with their work, he can tell immediately because they've all got the same right. look. And he says, I tell them, come back to me in five years when you figured out who you are. Right, right. Right? And, um, boy, can you imagine being told that as an artist? Yes. You probably have been told <laughs> that, right? Because that's, that's a hard thing. If you don't go out, which is another way of saying be original, which right. is, God, how do you, like, on the count of three, be original. Right. It's an almost impossible thing to ask of somebody. And I said to him that I felt like... Um, Almost everybody who had graduated from these ateliers, whether it's the water, sh the, 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 the Grand Central Academy, Michael Angel's Academy, the Florence Academy, all the academies that we have, we seemed, you know, there, this is me as an art historian putting on my art historian hat. There was a split um, during the turn of the century where there, there was a, in America in particular, um, there was a break between the fine artists and the illustrators. And there was a group who went with Wyeth and with Howard Pyle and decided that illustration was one thing. And then there were those who went with Ives Gamel and decided that fine art was another thing. Yeah. Right. And Ives Gamel taught Lack. Right. And Lack became the grandfather of all the current ateliers yeah. including those in europe right right and those guys inherited an anti-illustrator mindset which means that you're anti-multi-figural work interesting for yeah. the most part right you're anti so if you went to the academy in the 19th century 18th century 17th century and 16th century where it all started your first job as an eight-year-old to a 12-year-old was you'd be given onion paper which is this very clear paper, and you'd be given prints. And your job was to trace out multifigural black and white works just to get down very complicated multifigural compositions and perspective mm. and to try and absorb it. And you'd do that for two or three years. Wow. And then after that, you were given isolated casts or even concurrently, even concurrently with that, you were given isolated casts. And it's almost as if the lack approach got rid of that first part right and it yeah. just said it, it just said you know we're going to work on the human figure isolated yeah and the greco-roman ideal of 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 idealized simplified beauty of the human form and there's nothing wrong with that but it, in, in my mind because it does create an ideal that is that has a real tradition and craftsmanship behind it and it's something that when we have the insecurities that we do now we have this tremendous insecurity i think that people like jacob collins and great and parish would agree with me i know jacob collins does agree with me on this because i've had conversations with him about it that we felt like boy the academy fell apart it was replaced by a kind of everyone needs to learn what they're best at as a genius. And so right. Picasso figured out his own vocabulary and Moreau and Pollock and, and, and you just had, it was marketing of your particular interest yeah. and skill set that you invented. 
right, for your own vocabulary. Yeah. And and so when he wanted to learn to do things, he would start copying artists that he liked, and he discovered that as a late teen. And then he really got serious about it maybe in his 20s. Mm-hmm. And boy, then he learned that he learned that, that Jacques-Louis David and Aang were learning the things that he had learned in his 20s in their teens. Mm, right, right. And they had mastered them, quote unquote, in their 20s when he was, and he felt like he was only beginning to understand them in his 40s. Yeah. Right? We all understand this because it's all, we inherit this anxiety of, yeah. oh my gosh, I'll never catch up to, the, to these masters that I admire. Yeah. thing that we don't hear is that Bouguereau felt like he'd never catch up to Titian. Sure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And all we all feel like our, we're never going to catch up to our heroes. And 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 so you have this these descendants of Lack, of Richard Lack, who felt like, you know, you really need to, to before you can do anything serious, you need to master these skills. Right, right. And they put such an emphasis on these skills, almost to the exclusion of other things, that it created an anxiety of yeah. any time I create a figure, it has to be perfect. Yeah, that's interesting. And 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 then it becomes this sort of self-contained uh, concept of perfection relative to a figure in an empty space, which which doesn't necessarily apply to a figure in the interior or exterior or, or anything. It, it's a it's a conception of what is good, what is successful based on these very limited exercises and it that doesn't, don't have a larger context. And it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because then it, it becomes the basis of an argument of, you know what, you modernists who went to the Rhode Island School of Design, it takes real work to do a figure. I sit for 40 hours with right. a model. Right. Ang would spend four hours sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and he'd do his work. But we do 30 or 40 hours right. or 15 to 30 hours with a model in order to prove that it's really hard work to show modernists right. and, and people who don't have that skill what's set required to be what's a true required professional. to be a true fe- professional. Yeah. Yeah. But in the meantime, you're working harder than Aang did yeah. to do something that Aang would look at and say, it's very elementary. Why are you spending so much time with that? Yeah. You know, move yeah. on. You've got other things that you need to work on. Well, I think that's the danger that I've seen. It's the it's the cycle that that makes me the most afraid because I think uh, if it continues on this path, we're making the contemporary world's argument against us for them, which hmm. is it's already been done before. Who cares? And and if all we're doing is highly rendered student work. Um, I feel like we're kind of we're kind of agreeing with them. You're right. It's uh, w- we don't have anything else to say except look how well I can render, and and I think that you know to some degree you have to um, cut them a break. The 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 academy's a break because the the need to give a broader audience of of students the basic foundation is necessary. The, mm-hmm. the fact that it's taken 15, 20 years just to establish a, a kind of base foundation for the, the, the knowledge of uh, the language of drawing and painting again, I think it was a necessary step to start to piece that together because it was broken. There was, you know, when you, when the university all, all adopted the uh, this contemporary model of, of concept-driven art, uh, the technical skills faded. Um, mm. So... So that step has been important, but my fear is if we don't take the next step of uh, adjusting the focus from uh, um, just rendering these these student exercises really really well and praising that, be uh, making that this this the concept of succe- what makes a successful work of art, to really uh, putting the focus on what comes after that. This is important. That's a door I need to walk through. But towards what end? If we can't adjust the focus to more design, more composition, more narrative, um, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of where the the academies will be in 20 years if uh, um, if they'll still continue uh, to become more and more relevant, or if they will play their relevance out. I I share some of your concerns about this, and I I've got so many thoughts. I want to so. 
hold on to the, the, the this thought that of 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 an audience. Okay, so that that's something that's important I want to talk about. But before I mention that, I I, I just want to say that I think that um, there is. I am also not a fan of golden ageism. I'm not a fan of this idea that the past is always going to be better than us and we're always going to be playing catch up. Because Bougaro's generation and and not only the artists but the people who were there making art for weren't always the greatest connoisseurs. We think they were. We put them up on a pedestal. There was just as much bad art in their generation sure. as there was bad art now. And if you look at how your parents and my parents posed for photographs or took photographs, when we were kids, we we're so much better at taking photographs than yeah. we were. And part of that is that we live in a much more visual world. We are way better than the artists were of the past at a lot of things. There are, we are more visually attuned and we have an audience that's more visually attuned to what good images are and what a good portrait is and what a bad portrait is than they ever were. Brian Mark Taylor, who's a local artist that you and I both know, who taught at the Academy of Art in San Francisco for years, and he's, he's principally a landscape artist, but he some, does some still life. He's very fond of saying that, that we have more tools available to us that makes us potentially better than those right. in the past. Right. I agree. And I think that, that it, it was when I heard him say that at first, I remember thinking as an art historian who was so anxious to recover the past that I worshipped the past on some level that I, I was almost immune to him saying that we can do things, some things better than yeah. they could in the past. But he's right in general. The fact that we have got people who, we've got more people who are interested in looking at good art now than ever were in the 19th century. I recently took um, the California Art Club on a tour of the Bougaro exhibition mm -hmm. that went from the museum in Minneapolis down to San Diego's yep. Museum of Art. And um, <clears throat> Bougaro is a perfect example of one of these people we put on a pedestal. And who deserves it, right, for the large right. part, right? Yeah. But not for always the reasons that I think we, we think about. And um, I, when I went to this show on Bougaro, um, um, I've seen maybe, I've seen hundreds of Bougaros over the years, but not always together in the same room. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the real education yeah. of, of, of seeing this exhibition. And I, I, as I was, they asked me to write an article, and in the article, I was shocked. It was shocking how few interviews were done with Bougaro that we still have published that we can find online. Um, I need to go back to the Orsay, and I need to go to the Library of Congress, and I need to find some of the things that in the Bibliotheca you know, that that have um, some of his original accounts. He's almost like like Socrates or Jesus or the Buddha where he's got all the, he never really wrote anything down himself, but he's got all these people who were right. witnesses to what he said. And he's sitting in this interview in 1896, I think it was in May. And there's a reporter who comes to him, maybe it's 1891, a reporter who comes to him and says, this is maybe 15 years before he dies. And, um, this reporter says to him, so you're painting a lot of beautiful peasant women for American collectors almost in kind of a snarky way. Sure. And he said, yeah, well, you know, if I kept painting like this and the, and the, the aside from the reporter is, and he points to an image from Dante's Inferno. And we all know which one this is. It's the yeah. brothers that are right. It was fighting. A very early work. Yeah. He said, if I say. kept painting like that, no one would have ever bought my paintings. Yeah. And so I learned to paint what people wanted to see and paint them at a quality that I was happy with. Yeah, I think that that's kind of I think uh, it's kind of an admission of audience. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that um, it, you can make the greatest work in the world, but at some level you have to have the people who are going to receive it and accept it. Yeah, my concern, which is tied up with your larger concern of 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 the the echo chamber of the atelier system of impressive school uh, student work that gets better and better even after they leave, but is still about the concerns that they had as students. Yeah. If I'm phrasing that in a way that I think, I think sure. we can both agree that, yeah. that, that, that maybe that's a rephrasing of what you're saying mm -hmm. is that it's also an admission that for the past hundred years and even before then, um, modernism, 
and this is where I would agree with with Verne and 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 Fred Ross and a lot of the critics of modernism taught people that you can't look at a work of art and say whether or not it's good or bad. You have to be told mm. whether it's good or bad. You're going to show up in front of a Rothko and your first instinct potentially is going to be, what the hell is this? Right. Right. And why is it so amazing? My three-year-old could have done this. Yeah. But then you have to have a high priest who comes along <laughs> right. and says to you in their black clad modernist art historian uniform, maybe a poet's hat on top of that <laughs> and says to you, this is why he was a genius. Right. And you don't understand it because you're dumb and I will make you understand why it's great. And then they teach you the arguments behind it and they induct you into the system. Right. Yeah. Well, what happens when you are raised for a hundred years in that system? I was raised in that. You were raised in that. And then you're shown Washington crossing the Delaware. Right. Your job is not to think about it. Your job is to find who can tell you why it's great. Yeah. Right? And your job, to, when you look at a Bouguereau, maybe your instinct is to initially like it. But you're, you're suspicious of the fact that you like it. Right? Because you've been taught to be suspicious of right. your reasons for liking something. You've got to be taught the real reasons for liking something, yeah. right? And the academies are living within a world where they have done a very good job of teaching their students why art is worth admiring for the reasons that they admire it. Right. But they don't have a population that's, that's ready yet to receive their works of art for the reasons that they're making the works of art. Yeah. And then you have a group of artists who've bridged the gap in my mind because they look at why people like things on Instagram mm. and they apply those works to it. And I'm going to mention names, which I yeah. normally don't do because I truly admire these artists. Yeah. But I think they've bridged the gap. Nick Alm. Yeah. Jeremy Lipking. Casey Childs. Here are artists who have figured out how to apply a skill set which maybe the people who are admiring their works don't understand. Sure. But the artists have done the work for them by going and saying, here is a way in which you can understand it. And I, and I think that these same artists that I've just named are some of the most heavily criticized artists by atelier artists. Hmm. Because the atelier artists feel like sometimes these artists are taking shortcuts, which maybe they are, according to their inherited anxieties and aspirations, mm -hmm. they are, right? That's how people felt about Jerome. You know, yeah. Jerome was, was, uh, was seen as a lightweight intellectually. So was Bouguereau by the Academy because they believed that they were just making pretty p pictures and that they were basically the Instagram artists of their time. And, and I think that, um, that, that this is, that's not anything new. I think that what is new and the same concerns that you have and that I have that I think where we're, where we're on the same place is you've got these academies, which are trying to indoctrinate. That's such a negative word. I'm not trying to look for that word. They're trying to insist that there's a standard mm -hmm. at a time when people don't believe in need that there's a need for a standard. Yeah. Right. Or even if they do, they can't agree on what that would be or on what, it, and the people who, who it's, they're so far downstream from, from the understanding of there needs to be a standard is the audience in the end that receives the works. Yeah. And I feel like my job as an art historian, my main job, and this is why it's not my job to be an artist and an art historian is my job is when somebody walks through my door or when I write about an artist is to say, this is why what they're doing is worth looking at and why it's hard to do and why it's original and why it's great. And you as an audience need someone who's a critic, not to tell you what's bad and what could be improved, but to just describe to you what the artist is doing. Yeah. That's my entire, that's my whole thing. 
My job is to not tell you what's good or bad. That's why, you know, you and I can sometimes agree on what, who's a good or a bad artist privately, right? Yeah. But, but I feel like publicly my job is to say not this is somebody who's doing it and this is why you should love, this is why you should hate them or love them. It's just to, the bare minimum is to describe to the audience what they're doing yeah. and where they came from. That's why Walter Rain. So bring, bring more of a, uh, an awareness for, for artists and put them in the hands of collectors, kind of connect yeah. those two and be a champion rather than, than uh, uh, you know, offer yeah. critical review. I haven't written this down yet, but I've repeated it many times, so I feel like I've written it. But there, every, art, every art movement needs the following. It needs four legs. It needs people making art. It needs people buying and selling it. It needs people talking about it, critics, and then it needs a place where it can um, be accepted and canonized, like a museum. Yeah. Right? And how many of these legs do we have now? And which one of them do we have more effort on right now in this world of contemporary figurative art that we're in? We've got a very muscular first leg of people making art, right? We have almost a non, we have people buying and selling it. It's getting better. It's, yeah. I mean, if you were to look 10 years ago, it's it's a it's a it's it's uh you've got arcadia you've got principal you've got Anne long you've got you've got um on top of that you've got the whole world of artists selling directly to connoisseurs mm -hmm. who are really developing their own interest right that's coming along people talking about it almost no one's talking right. about the art that's right. being made I, one of the reasons i talked with steve at arcadia is i said what shows do you have coming up maybe i could write about it and he said in the 20 years i've been doing this I've had maybe two shows written about. Yeah. That's it. Well, With, uh, um, you, you typically have the, you know, a, a, an article in a, one of the magazines that will say, here's what's going on as almost an, as, as a marketing announcement, but right. not necessarily, a, not an analysis, yeah, right. right? Not an analysis of this is the school that this person comes from. This is where, right. how their work has changed over the years. This is, this is what they were right. thinking about and how they talk about their work. Yeah. Right. And almost like an a social anthropologist, yeah. understand it. And then the fourth one of a museum. I mean, there are some museums that you, we we live here locally in Utah, and we have a mu wonderful museum, the Springville Museum of Art. And I say wonderful with an asterisk because the job of the Springville Museum of Art is to take an ice core of what's being made regionally yeah. and collect that. And so they accidentally absorb works of art that are made regionally, right. but not with the ambition of any particular drive towards collecting the best of this figurative art, sure. right? And so there are very few museums that are, that, are, um, that are in the world that are collecting things with the deliberate drive of this is the best of the best. Yeah. There are museums that are collecting this is regionally what's going on, yeah. or this is thematically what's going right. on. I'm interested in LGBTQ art. I'm sure. interested in feminist art. I'm interested in communist art. I'm interested in this art. Yeah. You get those, right? Um, religious art as being one. Yeah. But you rarely get people museums that are actually collecting for those. And so until you really get um, an ecosystem like this happened in the 19th century of your and my ideal probably, which is you have a contest where 20,000 artists from around the world who are at top of their game are all submitting to the salon in Paris. Yeah. And then, it, then out of those 800, 500 works get shown that are the best out of those 20,000. Right. And then you get, if you show up at the door, um, 50 potential critical pamphlets that are all written that you can choose from. And you can tour the show reading Zola's or the Goncourt brothers yeah. or Jericho's, um, not Jericho's, um, um, you, you have very different interpretations of what they have to, of, of what are written and and then one one gets picked up and somebody says you know what that's a really good multifigural work why don't we blow that up to 10 times its size and put it in the municipal building and so we're going to commission you to do that right yeah. and and then um, you know a museum accepts it right I mean yeah. this is and it gets judged by a peer by a group of peers on top of, in, in in addition to all that. Yeah. We are very far away from that. Right, right. We may never get it again. 
right? It may never happen again. That yeah. is that was a pre movie television world. Television and movies getting it right now. Yeah. Right? They're getting it. And I I don't know. I don't know how I it, I feel like right now, um, if we had to compare it to a different world, I would say that can you imagine being a French chef in the 1950s right as TV dinners are becoming really popular, right? And then, and then you're thinking, nobody wants to come to school anymore. Yeah. Right? No one wants to come learn, learn at the Cordon Bleu. And then that student, student, who's still holding open the doors at the Cordon Bleu, um, hears that Anthony Bourdain is walking around and going to food carts. Yeah. <laughs> and you think, oh, man, Anthony Bourdain's saying some interesting things. He's going to food carts. Yeah. And he has good things to say about food carts, but why in the hell is he going to a food cart and he's not showing up at the Cordon Bleu and talking about what we're doing at the Cordon Bleu? We right. are the ones who are still teaching the skills. Yeah. Right? Of a souffle, of all of these other things, right? You have to learn these skills. Yeah. Um, but in room, enrollment's going up at the Cordon Bleu. Yeah. And there are a bunch of other people that are teaching things that the Cordon Bleu thinks are complete nonsense. Yeah. But in general, the rising tide of interest in food is raising, is, is right. raising all boats. It's raising the Cordon Bleu at the same time. And I think that if you are like you and I, we see the faults in the current system. We see that people who walk away from the Grand Central Academy or the Florence Academy or some of these other schools are not creating multifigural narrative works. Often. Yeah. Sometimes they are. And then we see people who are graphic designers who do create multifigural narrative works for multiplayer fantasy games, yeah. right? And we think, how dare they, <laughs> right? Or they're missing out on this, or they're missing out on that. Yeah, It's not an unfair criticism that they're missing out on those things. And they desperately want to be part of your club too, right? And they never will be, yeah. possibly. And you will never quite have the confidence because you know too much to be risk averse. <laughs> right. Right? To jump in and do some of the crazy stuff that they're doing without and they and they get some things right. Right, right. You know? And it's it's I think that's the world we live in. And I don't I don't know how or if we'll ever get back to being able to create the Pantheon in Paris. Yeah. You know, we'll never, we'll never be creating, um, some of those, the, 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 the St. Genevieve, um, in her, in her bed with all of those amazing figures in a 40 foot high by 40 foot wide piece. Yeah. We'll probably be creating works for that executive at, Microsoft to go above his fireplace. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're not going to have another Boston public library that, you know, commissioned Sergeant and you may not have Austin Abbey to do monumental works. And occasionally you hear about him. Occasionally you hear about him. I mean, you've got a K you have, we live here. Utah is such a weird place. It is the headquarters of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which has about 16 million, um, uh, members. And they, have a real interest in visual material to illustrate their doctrine. And they've got a real mixed record. They've brought in artists like Harry Anderson occasionally or Tom Lovell, who were, Tom Lovell especially was a first rate Western artist who trained in Syracuse, New York, and was good friends with Rockwell and some of these other people. And he'll occasionally be brought in to illustrate something. And then a bunch of people will love the work that he does and never learn his name. Yeah. And they'll, and, and, and then when they find out that somebody who, who wasn't ever a member of their church made it, they'll overlook it. Yeah. <laughs> right. They'll yeah. be like, yeah. it's, a, it's become an iconic, uh, it's become an image. iconic thing. Um, is that how Caravaggio felt? you know, about some of his works making it for a church. We've got, 
you've got but but there are there are sometimes works that are being made within this environment that are monumental and ambitious but they're not always made by the best artists yeah and you feel like it's a missed opportunity but then there's another party that says well maybe they'll keep making and they'll eventually hit one yeah right I mean, just and the catholic church i mean how many bad works of art have we seen in catholic churches yeah for every one good one there's two or three thousand bad ones that we've right. seen right the batting average i don't think changes over time mm. And, and I, I think that that's where hope is. Right. Hope is just in filling the funnel with material yeah. over time, right? Filling it with as many artists as we possibly can. I think we're living in a time where there are more artists making more work than maybe ever. That's right. Ever. And there's hope in that. There's hope in yeah. that. And there is, a, there is also probably a larger audience a larger patronage even though the patronage system has changed um which is a, a whole nother conversation you know that we we've been frustrated with trying to develop a, a stronger uh patron audience the audience is still much larger probably than it's ever been there's yeah. still a lot more people buying work um even with the ebbs and flows and that right now we're in uh, this pandemic with the COVID-19 and I think there's a lot of uncertainty to that, uh, how that's going to affect galleries, how it's going to affect sales, how we present work. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've seen it with the gallery here. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you, you have to shut down that, um, uh, the drop-ins and the, uh, the, the walk through traffic mm -hmm. is, is almost non-existent. I know the galleries that I'm in winter was there, main season you know you get into february march that's their strongest part of the season and now you know everything's shut down so yeah. how we present work how this is going to um affect it is is really uncertain but at the same time the positive takeaway is that there's still a buying audience and then yeah they are still buying even if they might you know have it on pause for a second i think uh there, there's still a, a a pretty large audience that still appreciates this work I think there is, and I and, and you know I vacillate on this all the time. I had a discussion with a with a um, so I've got a client who is one of the world's foremost um, directors of marketing in the world. He oversees Hermes, Louis Vuitton, American Express, mm. Coca Cola, Disney, and all of their marketing. He's got a home here. He's got one in in uh, New York, and um, he travels a lot and. Uh, and he associates with a lot of very, um, with with the the high, the celebrity class, the director class, all of these people, um, and and he has a passionate for visual arts and good painting. And I remember um, I, he over, he came to a lecture that I gave once where I said I'm tired of hearing about a, a renaissance coming. And hearing the burden and the discussion being about how artists need to get better. And what I want to hear is I want to hear how we're going to get Medici's, not yeah, not Michelangelo's. I want to stop talking about Michelangelo. I want to start talking about who are the patrons in, yeah. this, in this argument about a renaissance. And start putting your money where your mouth is kind of thing. It took a lot of generations of Medici's before they got... And Sforza's and, right. and Borgia's before we actually got the, the, the real the really good stuff yeah. right and um he heard that and he said okay i'm gonna put my money where my mouth is let's get a group of let's get a group of artists and uh and patrons and gather at my house and right. and he flew in people from new york and and uh, brought a group of artists that he picked and people that he picked to sit down and they weren't the same people i would have necessarily picked mm -hmm. but i thought you know great we're having a discussion and he said um, as we're walking, he were going around the room and he asked every one of them, what do we need to create this renaissance? And um, every one of them said, better schooling, better education. Mm -hmm. And when it came to me, I was like the eighth person to speak. I was ticked off. I said, what the hell? <laughs> I said, none of you have said, we need people who, who are going to support these artists. Yeah. And this fellow um, said to me, he kind of put me in my place, and I have mixed feelings about it. But he said, he said, Micah, um, 
Last week, all week, I was with Lynn manuel Miranda working on a commercial. We hired him for American Express. He said, that man's a genius. He said, if you had told me, um, if he had come to me and said, I've got this really cool idea for a musical. We're going to do this hip-hop, American, political work. I would have said, okay, whatever. Yeah. I wouldn't have said it was a great idea. He said, and now people are paying $5,000. This is the time at its height when we're having sure. this discussion. Now we're paying $5,000 a seat to go see it for one night. He said, Micah, um, I appreciate you saying that we should just support artists. But he said, the real answer is that somebody needs to create something so startlingly wonderful that we all want it. Yeah. He said, and then the patronage will come. I still don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Because I, cause I, Michelangelo had a lot of backing before he got to, to David and before he got to um, his major works. Um, yeah. A lot of these artists did. There, the, the answer is, is that, that it's, there's no clean answer. Yeah. And that it's going to, it takes a committee to get there. Yeah. And, and I think there, there is a village. I'm, I'm going to say village instead of committee. I think it ta- there are villages out there. There mm-hmm. are tribes of people that are supporting artists. You, we've talked about Shane Wolf before. Mm-hmm. He's got a consortium. Right. Of people that are supporting and he's creating wonderful things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Chicken and egg. Did he create them before then or was he creating because yeah. of them or you know what? Who knows? Right. Yeah. It's it's you can argue for for it's both. Right. Um I I don't know um I don't know what um it's gonna take yeah. to move from where we are because I'm with you. I think that the Atelier model is good. Yeah. And there are great things coming out. There are good things coming out of it. Great things? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I think, it, it, are the numbers better than in the 19th century? Right. I don't know if the percentages are any better. Well, I think that's that's one thing I've battled, um, you know, having a, a small school in Utah and trying to bring this education back is um, trying to get support for that even back to 2004, 2005. Uh, you know, attending meetings with a lot of big artists, uh, supporters of the arts that uh, are, are, have been talking for decades now about uh, wanting to cre- help create a renaissance by bringing the education. And, and, you know, I felt like coming back from the Florence Academy and starting the school was significant, sharing the ideas with potential uh, donors. Um, it, it just seems like people want to be part of something that's already something. It's yes. hard to sell an idea. It just like yeah. he argued, this fellow argued, yeah. you know, show me Hamilton and I'll yeah. come help you. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's an uphill battle for sure. Um, okay. So I want to get back to, to you and what you do here. Um, okay. Because I think uh, you guys I've been told are the biggest art dealers in Utah. I think it's significant that, um, the things that you bring here, walking, uh, every time I have somebody visit, I try to bring them here. There's a feeling to the, the building itself. There's a feeling to um, just the clutter of amazing stuff that's here uh, um, from clocks, furniture, couches, that, that room upstairs that's, you know, the whole wood paneled room you brought over from France and reconstructed um, I want for my studio. Um, <laughs> Uh, the the type of work you're bringing through, you've had Bougaro, Sargents, uh, um, Leightons, and just bringing that to our community. I know you sell globally, but um, bringing that to our community and having that available, this is a living museum. It, it's constantly changing. You have mm-hmm. this work here. Um, what's the... So the, the story I'll, behind I'll this, is this, this is Emmanuel Leutz's um, flight, into, flight out of Egypt, sorry, departure of the Israelites. Um, Emmanuel Leutz is the artist who did Washington Crossing the Delaware. The massive work in the in the National Gallery, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's in the Met. It's in the Met. The, oh, you're right. Yeah. And uh, and he is one of the greatest artists of the 19th century. And he yeah. taught at the uh, he studied in Dusseldorf and then taught at the Munich Academy. And he taught Bierstadt and Whistler and Duvenick and and uh, it, yeah, that this is this is work that we're sitting in front of, which is roughly eight feet by 10 feet. Yeah. It's a, it's a masterpiece. And 
we we regularly get things of this yeah kind of quality here this is the best museum even though it's just it's an antique <laughs> it's an art- shop it's a it's a place where yeah. you come to buy art this is really has been for me the best museum in utah well my father started this gallery um in the in the early 80s and um and and it started as kind of a furniture store excuse me and then he um went to europe on a uh, and started buying directly in europe and was buying high-end furniture and he's a real connoisseur and developed over time his own eye he would get we would go to the point where he would go to and i'd go with him to paris and we'd go through a fair that had a million objects and he'd buy three things and 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 we'd fill we we still get two or three shipments a year from europe of furniture but occasionally he would walk into a a gallery and he would pick out one or two things and they would turn out to be <laughs> i'll tell you we recently had this uh this uh this work that um god i remember i gotta get the name off uh, uh, the name right um he would just regularly find masterpieces yeah and um it'll come to me in a minute i've got so many stories that i could share of works that he found that they were unattributed and then we were able to find out for yeah. one in one for instance is there was this minor sale that took place back east in philadelphia the catholic church was being sued for sexual abuse um controvert a, a, a case that had been brought against them and the catholic church um the diocese in philadelphia decided to sell off a lot of its uh of of, of its buildings and they hired it's like an a firm that that worked on real estate auctions hmm. to sell all of the interiors. Well, there's this painting that this guy in construction boots was standing next to with a hard hat of, of some figures and all they had in the bottom corner was Zimmerman. So we bought it without knowing what it was. And we all thought it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I figure out what that is. By the time it got to us, I had figured out that Zimmerman was Ernst Zimmerman, and that the painting was 12-Year-Old Christ in the Temple, which in 1879 had won the 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 Munich um, World's Fair gold medal painting, and he had beat out Tatama, he'd beat out Leighton, wow. and this was the work. Yeah. And it had been bought by somebody in Philadelphia visiting the World's Fair who donated it to his local church, hmm. and it had been sitting in obscurity for 100 years. 120 years and and this is what we specialize in so our yeah. business model if you were to ask what our business model is our business model is quality and it is that's it's that simple our entire business is based on our ability to find things that are unappreciated that are worth appreciating yeah i spend maybe 70% of my time looking at auctions, sales, contacting people and trying to find things that auction houses miss because I know this because I went to the the uh, the, the 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 Sotheby's and I have friends who went to Christie's and to some of these other schools. They were taught mostly that the way an auction house makes money is by finding the most important 100 names in the art world, mm. contemporary and past. Picasso, Banksy, Damien Hurst, yeah. Tracy Emin, whatever it is, you name it, and Coons, and find those those works and sell them to oligarchs. Right, right. Right? Which means that over the past 20 or 30 years, as their model has changed, the real connoisseurs who taught me and who taught us, um, who had sometimes worked at these auction houses for um, 30 or 40 years and had seen millions of objects and could really understand quality are being replaced by people who work at Sotheby's, Christie's, and Bonham's for five years to get it on their resume and then mm. start a contemporary gallery. And I I can go toe-to-toe with almost anybody at Sotheby's and Christie's and I can see something they've missed. Yeah. They'll mislabel things in their that come to their auction house. They... They don't understand something's been offered to them that they didn't understand and they don't have the time or energy or understanding to do the research and find out what it is and then put it up for sale for what it is. They only focus on the lowest hanging fruit. 
Right. So we try and find something that's maybe a little more difficult. Yeah. And our main goal is to find it and uh, and and then try and send it to the best destination. Yeah. So that Zimmerman ended up in a museum, and there were two museums interested in it: a local museum that was interested in it for its religious content, and then a museum in Munich that was interested in it because its connection yeah. to Munich. Right. And the local museum won. Hmm. Um, right now, if you were to look around where we're standing, we've got this Emanuel Leutze. That was the work he did for his pre to Rome, essentially. His graduation from the academy. And um, it is the work that he was showing his full arsenal of skills. We're able to sell it for a tenth of its value. Yeah. But how many people are going to... It should be at the Smithsonian. Yeah. It should be at, at the Met. It should be at the Getty. Who's interested in it right now? Few universities. Mm -hmm. Potentially the Museum of the Bible because of its content. Right? Yeah. There's parts of you that kind of go, oh, maybe it shouldn't go to these places. Yeah. Across from me, across from there is another work that's uh, by um, Thomas Locke. It is a... 27 foot high window by 16 foot wide of uh, that was done by a student of John Lafarge who basically taught Tiffany how to do windows hmm. and it's of the Sermon on the Mount and if you were to make that today it would cost you six million dollars and we can sell it for hundred and twenty thousand dollars wow and now we're trying to figure out where's that gonna go yeah and we don't know that's the problem yeah and then to my left is a work by Minerva Teichert, who studied with Vanderpool at the Inst Art Institute of Chicago. She, he said that she was his best uh, um, uh, student of anatomy. You wouldn't know necessarily looking at this because she decided that that wasn't the most important yeah. aspect of her work. She often sacrifices um, anatomy for gesture mm -hmm. and composition. And then she studied with Robert Henry, and Robert Henry told her to come back to the West to paint the story of her people. And this is a painting of Captain Bonneville trading with the Native Americans and trappers in Northern Utah. And it is seven feet by 10 feet. And it should go into a museum. Yeah. So here I'm surrounded by three masterpieces. Oh, and, and over on the other side, I've got a work by Charles Haywood, who was a student of, of, uh, uh, of Burne Jones. And uh, he was... He studied at the uh, at the uh, um, uh, um, at the Beaux Arts Academy in Paris, as well. And it's a it's a portrait of T. S. Eliot's wife, um, who is his daughter, who is who is Charles Haywood's daughter, yeah. Vivian Haywood. And I'm looking at you. Look around these things. I'm surrounded by them every day, and every one of them is a little quirky. Yeah, because they're well, not you have a portrait by Robert Henry upstairs still. Robert Henry, I've uh, got. Do you still have the Bougaro? Uh, I do. Study I have Bougaro study Seder. for the Nymphs and Seder. and they're not. You know, they're not um, home runs in the sense that if they were all Picasso's mistresses, yeah, <laughs> they'd be flying out the door, right? Right. But but I'm I'm not in that business. If I yeah. were in the Picasso mistress painting business, um, I wouldn't be able to have the diversity of things I do. I would be yeah. in a 20 foot long, five foot wide gallery in downtown London, Paris, yeah. Barcelona, um, New York. Yeah. And I would be only dealing in those works and I'd only be talking to people who are interested in works for investment purposes for the most part. Right. Right. But here I get to, I have to have a very broad range of skills. I don't know if I told you that a few weeks ago, I bought one of the most important Japanese Netsuke collections that has come up on the market in the past 50 years. And Japanese Netsuke are little carvings, often in ivory or fruit wood. And, you know, they're going back to Virginia to be sold because mm. we don't have the audience for yeah. them here. And I spent the past three weeks killing myself to try and... I've seen lots of Netsuke carvings over the years. I've learned more about them over the past three weeks than I knew that than most people ever learn in their lifetime. Yeah. But when we saw them, we didn't know how important they were. We just knew they were quality. Yeah. And we took a risk. We bought them um, at a terrible time to take risks on buying things. <laughs> yeah. 
And that, that, is, that is, I think, more than anything what I've learned in this business from my father, which is quality is what's important. And you have to step up and pay for quality when you see it. And trust that you will be able to teach people what it is. Yeah. And he is, if anything, and this is something I'm learning to be, a good teacher. Yeah. You have to be able to bring in somebody, because this is the world we live in. Utah is a weird place to be selling this, but it doesn't matter because I have been in London. There's just as many stupid people in London who do only buy things because they think that it makes them look good yeah. as there are here. And there are just as many connoisseurs here as there are anywhere else in the world. Mm. 70% of our clients are out of state or around the world. Yeah. And we're constantly teaching people yeah. why something's important. Yeah, and I think that's what makes this place and what you do such a a treasure, at least for me, um, over the years. This is the this is the mecca of where I'm going to come to to be inspired. Uh, it means a um, lot that you'd say that. Yeah, I, I mean the the intuition that you guys have, not you know, added to the education, the understanding, but the intuitive sense of quality is is impeccable. And uh, I'm I'm always amazed coming in at the c the consistency of mm. what you have to show. I mean, it's it's painful to visit because <laughs> I can't leave with with stuff all the time. Oh, that's I just, how I I'm, feel too. Uh, uh, to be surrounded by it, um, even for a moment, is um, it's why I would come to Salt Lake. I would take a special trip for. Oh, um, that means a lot. And you, you were, and you're like me that occasionally we get crumbs, right? Yeah. Crumbs fall off the table of this place. Yeah, yeah. That you know, I'm I'm kind of a cobbler who can't afford shoes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can't afford having this Loitza in my house. Yeah. I don't have a house for it, and there's something selfish about having this in my house yeah, if I were yeah. able to have it, right? But occasionally I'll get a drawing by a Henry, or I'll get right, this right. or that, right? And and those are the, and, and you just feel, you feel like, and this is something I've learned from my father, that the best you can be is a steward. Is a steward, right. Your a job is to be a steward and a custodian of other people's yeah. talents. And your job isn't to, your job is to, is, you know, the history of art is, is not of the people who owned the pieces usually. But those people were key to the work's survival over time and the best you can hope for in our business is to be the person who just shepherds it on yeah. a little to the next generation right. and who raises its status a little bit by making sure that whoever gets it next is informed about yeah. what it is yeah has a greater appreciation based on a deeper understanding of where it came yeah. from what it, its purpose was and and so that I I don't want to keep you too long. I could talk, talk to you all day. Um, but how do you? How have you? Because recently, in the last few years, you've started also showing living artists, which yeah. is not something you had done uh, much in the past. Um, as you're describing value uh, for uh, a 19th century work of art, 18th century work of art, with with something like this, you can talk about its uh, provenance. You can talk about the artist who created it, where they came from, who, who they studied with. Um, there's so many points of, of um, in, in your description of it that give it value. Mm -hmm. how, do you, um, how do you see presenting something like that versus living artists? How do you, um, how do you prescribe value? Because for me, I look at, uh, say, like the portrait of T.S. Eliot wife, and I think... I would give anything for that. Um, but I have a connection to other living artists. I walk upstairs and see the living artists. Some, you know, I have some paintings here as well. And, and um, um, to me, there's a familiarity of it because yeah. I know these people that makes it less valuable than the 19th century because there's almost a mystique uh, with the history yeah. of it. Um, but oftentimes I see living work, uh, or works by living artists selling for much more than even the, oh, yeah. the ancient works with mystique. It's depressing so sometimes. How do you how yeah. do you present that to clients? How, as as somebody who's 
uh, for the majority of time, been presenting works that do have a, a, a provenance. How do you then um, present works by living artists? How do you talk about it differently? I'll tell you, that's a, it's a really good question, and it's something that I am still trying to figure out, and I'm not entirely happy with it. Um, gosh, I don't want to leave it at that, <laughs> because, <it's, laughs> because there, there's a lot of ways to answer your question. And I'll give you a, a, few, a few ways that I think about it. So... Number one is um, we, can, we have to play to our strengths, right? So we have an existing market of people who are interested in a particular kind of traditional art, which gives us a parameter of which we can function in, right? So we can't always, we can't do highly um, experimental stuff and, and have our existing base of clients follow us there always. Sometimes we can pull off that, but you know, not often, right? We're not going to have a Jackson Pollock here. We're not going to have the contemporary version of Jackson yeah. Pollock here, even if we wanted to. Not saying that we do, right? Because it's not going to jive with uh, John Singer Sargent or Bouguereau. Mm -hmm. And we've worked very hard to educate our clients as to why those things are worthwhile. At the same time, it's often easier to find very, very high quality stuff in the past than it is in the present, which is more of a mixed bag because the things that have survived from the past that we're able to collect now are often of very high quality and very cheap. Mm. And I would hate to be an artist, a contemporary artist today, trying to compete with some of the artists that we have in here. Yeah. It'd be a hard thing, right? Yeah. So we often have to separate it out in the kinds of places we put them in different places yeah. than those works. Having said that, um, people are very interested in getting to know contemporary artists in ways that they don't care about dead artists. There's a cult of personality around contemporary artists. Yeah. So it does matter who you're dealing with. You have to have an artist that you're willing, that, that you're interested in and willing to talk about. Yeah. And um, that means finding artists who we like their work and we like them, right? We like being able to tell their story and talk about them. Yeah. And those vary in their degrees of showmanship, of P.T. Barnum, just, you know, down to... Some artists are just real nuts, and, yeah. and people like them because of who they are. And we can sell them not on the strength of their, of their skill level, but on the strength of... And that's a legitimate reason to want art in that's your right. house. It's sometimes a disappointing reason for you know, why a thing sells. Yeah. But if I, had to, if I had to put it in the best light, I would say that you know, talking with the Arcadia Gallery, it's interesting... I've been thinking a lot about this lately. When I was talking with Steve last time I was there, I told him how I felt like his place compared to mine was very bare. You walk in here and you're walking into like a 19th century salon. Yeah. It's, it's full of Persian rugs and ceramics and sculpture and stained glass and rich, rich materials that mm -hmm. make it feel almost palatial walking yeah. into this space. And you walk into his space and it feels like a black box mm -hmm. that's a contemporary studio. And he said, oh, well, 80% of my sales are online. Mm -hmm. I don't need to, to, to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. Right? And that was a really important point for me. Because for me, I feel like as the world is becoming more digital, studies have shown that luxury sales go in two directions. One is the brand name where people are buying Louis Vuitton mm -hmm. online because they know it's Louis Vuitton and right. they can buy it with a hundred percent confidence that they're always going to get Louis Vuitton if they're buying it from the right source. Right. Right. right? So Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, that level, that is where he plays. He gets the marquee names. People don't need to come in person yeah. and hang out because they know that what they're getting is the highest quality. Mm -hmm. But then, which is a little disappointing for artists because uh, there's this conversation that, you know, we love Instagram, we love the ability to promote and uh, have more people get to see our imagery. But when you're making a work of art, you're making an object to be viewed and experienced. And so In the person. fact that it's yeah being purchased online is is a little bit uncomfortable because yeah. you, you want somebody to buy a, a painting because they appreciate it right. in person. You're making it to be seen in person. And that's where I play. Because yeah. if you were to go with his world, his world is established artists 
um, buying online. It's selling Chanel to Chanel audience, right. uh, Chanel fans, right? And th- there's another part of what's happening in the, in the online world, which is the more people are buying things online, their necessities, they want an actual experience mm. with some places. And my place fills that need. The wealthy of the wealthy come in here because they can't, they come in here for an experience. They want to be educated. They want to be, they want to see things they've never seen before, things that they didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. My job is to be a cave of wonders. Yeah. And when you're in the cave of wonder business, your job is to teach people about things they've never seen before. Yeah. Which means the kinds of artists that I want are artists that I can tell them about. Mm-hmm. And that is where I would rather be. Yeah. I would rather be in the job of, and when I bring in artists, I bring in artists who are, you know, admittedly, they're of different levels of quality, but there are different reasons why I want to talk about them. Mm. And it's not always a great argument for quality, but it's a good argument for for connoisseurship and the same reasons that you and I always have connoisseurship for why we like artists in the past. Yeah. But it is often a good argument for... Um, for why people should be buying these local artists. Mm. And I f- mostly focus on local artists. Yeah. Because I, you know why be in the international contemporary art game? Because I'm, uh, that's not my job. Yeah. My job isn't to be Arcadia or Principal or Anne Long. Mm-hmm. My job is to teach local buyers as much as I can about local artists. Yeah. I am, my money in the business is not in selling local art. Uh, I'll, and I'll kind of end with this story if that's all right. Yeah. So, and this, this sums up my business pretty well. I had a contemporary artist. She does, she's the descendant of a 19th century artist who was foundational to Utah art, George M. Ottinger. And she creates what look like abstracted works, but are based on 19th century quilt patterns. And she has a very good sense of design and color. And she came to me and said, and we'd had some, hosted some nonprofit exhibitions here, and her works always sold to my clients. Mm. They were unlike anything I'd ever sold before. And so I was said, you know, fine. We, <laughs> we would love to have your work here. Yeah. We'll try it out. But it's not like anything we've ever sold before. She said, great, I'll do, I'll do 25 pieces, and they'll be priced, they were all priced somewhere between like $2,500 and $10,000. So not high priced, but not... Yeah. Sure. Bargain basement, right? And they were upstairs in a gallery that we almost never sell anything out of, right? But we were able to bring in hundreds of people to come see it. Yeah. We sold 19 of our 25 works. Mm. And we as a gallery netted something like $40,000. Mm. At the same time, I found a work by a 19th century master that I bought for $35,000 and sold for $200,000. Wow. I made three or four times the amount on one work that was undervalued and underappreciated, rediscovering it and selling it than I made in months of effort with her exhibition. And you would say, okay, well, Micah, your job then is to go out and just find a bunch of unappreciated masterpieces. Don't spend any time with contemporary artists. But the real... The real answer is there, in my opinion, that I have a stewardship mm. to do both. Yeah. Because my job was to listen to my clients who had a real under- real appreciation for her on some level. And I feel like her stuff wasn't always my taste, really. Yeah. And it had very little to do with a lot of the things that... And I learned a lot from her and from the things that people were interested in about her. But in the, and in the end... The economics didn't always make sense in it, but mm-hmm. the dynamics of having the conversation with people coming through, because the people who liked her art ended up coming in and buying other things that they were yeah. never seen before. And that I got to teach them about yeah. and say, look, you like her because it's fresh and interesting and colorful and bright. Here's other things that I can teach you about. Yeah. And so there's a dyna- dynamism. Yeah. So of it's kind one. of a synergistic yeah. uh, expansion of... Of and I your other business and so don't I, I and you can't deny this you've come into the gallery sometimes and you said why are you like you I can see it in your face I'm like why are you carrying that artist <laughs> and I don't always have a great answer you know yeah. and the answer is 
that it's symbiotic because yeah. the because there's a market for that artist and it's a rare thing enough that somebody's buying art if i can bring in their audience and teach them yeah that raises their game yeah and so you're doing something that i i just don't think very many um gallery owners even have as a, as a goal or a thought which is really developing connoisseurship that's and it. that's the thing that i i, I think if, if we have any hope as artists for uh, a revival of patronage that's what it takes and i yep. think i think um beyond just the immense quality that you bring to utah uh, beyond the the vast amount of objects that you bring through here i think that's why you're the greatest treasure here that's yeah. if if mm. we have any hope uh of getting where we want to go and connecting those two worlds the development of connoisseurship is really important and as an artist i i don't feel qualified to, to do that um and so we're and it just, shouldn't be your job yeah we're you just, shouldn't you shouldn't have to make it and be the advocate for it yeah in my yeah. opinion yeah that's what the best that's what my job is i shouldn't have to make it either yeah my job is to tell other people why it's so great. Yeah. That's it. Well, we're incredibly, incredibly lucky to have you and your father in the shop. And um, I really appreciate you taking so much time to sit down and talk to us. No, oh, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. This is a real privilege to sit and talk with you about it. I don't yeah. get to do this. I'm like everybody else. I spend most of my time sitting in front of a computer all day. Yeah. And it sounds like I have really high-level discussions all the time. Well, but you've got a pretty amazing office to sit in I front do, of a computer. I do. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Ryan. It's yeah, a privilege. Thank you uh, for listening, and um, that's it. Thanks. It's a wrap. That's it. Is that, is that Ben and Carrie Hammond over there?
Don't leave me here. 